Is that the intro? Should we start now? <laughs> no, it's not to say I need the masking for the start. sat down with a passage we were asked to compare and uh, could be a story about you know one or two of David's wives and Jezebel and, and you know, the different wives of the kings uh, in Hebrew history. Oh, is that? I mean, I promise not to uh, <laughs> but every time we would sit down, these even the those who translated did their own translation of the Hebrew would come up with a little twist on the story and what was happening in the story. You know, and uh, there was always some differences. There was rarely any time when there weren't differences in the trans the translation. <coughs> the so part of the reason is Hebrew doesn't have any vowels, so you can have the same cons consonants for multiple words. So how do you determine what that word really is? Well, they go back and see the context in which it's been used, and maybe it's been used in this context three or four times, and in this context once, and, and so. You know, it becomes very elaborate to do that that translation. That's why when you look at the front of your Bible, you'll see a list of a hundred people who are involved in the translation of, of the Bible because it's a real uh, extensive extensive task. Uh, and and so that said, that's why you know you have different translations. But if you if you look at the commentary. Uh, Terry, 
you want to go ahead and buy the three hundred or six hundred dollar book or whatever you want to do? I think so. Uh, they were out of stock. They, yeah. uh, they were out of stock. <laughs> <laughs> they are out of stock. Today. Everything that you get is, is used. I mean, it's a photocopier. Yeah. That's about the only way you'll probably get one. Uh, but if you look at, he has got, done an extensive search of the Old Testament of the the um, throughout the whole Bible basically is where how different passages were used, where they were used, uh, what it referred to, you know, the Daniel story and Ezekiel and, and Isaiah, uh, all of those different <coughs> places where there were visions and uh, that stuff. You can start, George. Mm -hmm. Oh, I already started. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so that, you know, I think, yes, translations are different. I, I just find uh, this, I find his interpretation of this vision and story more in line with what we as Christians generally understand who Jesus was, what Jesus taught us, uh, how we generally understand God uh, uh, after having read uh, the rest of the New Testament and some of the Old Testament. Uh, so I think his understanding and interpretations help uh, support the gospel message that we normally read in other places. So. It, he helps it fit within the rest of the, the scripture. And I don't think he really manipulates to do that. I think he's just, he translates maybe in a different way. And he's looking for the benefit of the church, not necessarily for the benefit of the future. Part of what part of what you're having to deal with is see this compare compare with what you have what they've tried to do is condense what's in here uh, into this and part of, part of the part of the problem is that condensing of the, that makes it even a little more difficult I think that's the cliff notes yeah the cliff notes are a little hard to read yeah. than a regular uh, but, but and I have to say, I when I first read through this, the, you don't normally read commentaries anyway, but I didn't realize it was a commentary until I started getting into it. But uh, but I think it took me probably two months of reading uh, to get through uh, this. Going back and checking Bible references, uh, looking at the other. Saying, you know, uh, so, uh, but I found his perspective just so compelling compared to all the other people out there. I mean, is there anything else out there from, I mean, this is to me it's an amillennial perspective. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else out there that is more accessible that has that perspective? I don't think, not that I have found. I wouldn't say I'm a revelation scholar by any stretch of imagination, but I haven't seen anything else. I don't think this guy's work is, is geared to an audience of lay people. No, I don't at all. Maybe, no, maybe, no. maybe they were trying to make this and lay professional, but it just didn't, yeah. didn't I don't think work for lay people. I think they tried to take it and, and make it that way, but you know, with yeah. this, but I uh, probably could have done a lot better. Sell more with bucks, it. you know. Yeah. Well, and we could we could probably have taken a lot more time with this. Um, and again, my intent was not to have you become a hundred percent proficient at what's in the Book of Revelation. It's to give you an impression of 
kind of the book of Revelation that now you tell us. Yes. <laughs> no, you tell us. We're going to be yeah. so perfect at this. <laughs> we can teach it. Go right ahead. Uh, no, we don't have John's gospel. We can then. teach it. You'll learn a lot more. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. We know from John's gospel that he's. Although seeming, he wasn't he one of the fishermen? So that he had a very mystical, you know, kind of a turn of mind, a sort of a self made philosopher kind of a person who had a very mystical, you know, well, if you read the gospel, he's even that way. So, yeah, if you read the gospel of yeah, John, it's, it's, a, it's so a different from the know, others. You know, in so, the beginning was the word, the word yeah, was good, yeah, God, the word was good. <laughs> so his take on everything is a little bit, you know, off of the uh, normal, shall we say. Well, it is. Or average. <laughs> It is in some ways uh, more uh, uh, metaphorical in terms of even even in the Gospel of John, even though it's not a vision. You know, when he talks about feeding of the five thousand, it's not just about feeding of the five thousand. It it has meaning way beyond that. It's not just about turning the water to, to wine at, at the wedding in Cana. It has implications far beyond. That. He's telling. He's telling you something by telling you a story that has a lot deeper meaning than, than that. And that's, and that's the essence of the vision. It is, it's a vision that has so much deeper meaning, and then he's trying to explain it. Uh, he's, he's writing in Greek, and we're trying to read it in English, and, and, and uh, so we do have some barriers to understanding. There's no doubt about that. Uh, and... Uh, no, it's not easy. It is, it is not easy to understand. Uh, the uh, we've talked a little bit about uh, numerology, but there is a term that I wrote on the board. I found it in his. Uh, he used it in here. And you can we can see this online. You can look up gematria. Uh, gematria is that. Uh, uh, it's a where we came, came up with, how they come up with uh, Nero being the, the beast. They assign numbers to the letters of the, Greek, of the uh, uh, Hebrew alphabet. And then uh, you, uh, you take a name and, and uh, total up the, the, the numbers and whatever it comes out to. So supposedly, Nero's name, depending upon how it was spelled and how it was used, either was 666 or 616. And that's that's how Nero got to be pointed as whoever the beast was. But the reality is, the beast is really a lot more than just Nero. It's, I mean, there's two beasts, and that's how we talk about the false prophet and the, as well as the beast from the sea. But the... Um, the beast is uh, is not just a, a personage, but it is um, a whole system uh, behind uh, behind who Nero was and, uh, and the system of the Roman Empire. Uh, you could probably throw uh, just about every empire into the beast category. Uh, Think of the Spanish Empire, the British Empire. British Empire. I mean. <laughs> Every empire, to be the beast. <laughs> every empire has a beastly uh, persona. Uh, yeah, people get ground under the feet of, uh, of, of empire. Um, even those who are members of empire get ground into the machinery of, of empire. So that's, <clears throat> that's the, the nature of it. Uh, we're in that too. We're in the midst of yeah. the destiny, the manifest destiny associated with that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Point though, the that society depending upon which society we're in, if we're in the U.S. society, I think that in some things within our culture that we become desensitized. And you start to accept, or some people accept some things where other people say, wait a minute, that's wrong. 
And I think where that is the message that parallels the everything must change. And see, I'm still looking well, at that. Well, connect, it's connected. And, and the message in here and the application to modern day society. You know, where are we headed? And also within the church, with the Methodist study that we had done earlier, uh, you know, are we doing what we're supposed to do? We're called to. Right, or did we get swallowed up into the, the wealth and the greed and the materialistic things and forget what's really important? Let me read uh, this passage from, uh, and he's, he's referencing uh, chapter 13, verses 9 through 10, supposedly, is what he's referencing. But in the contemporary world, the beast is incarnate in the pervasive worldview of the so-called naturalistic humanism. We talked about that last week. That shapes human life and society. The naturalistic aspect, I can't even talk tonight, <laughs> of this perceptual framework views human existence set within a closed system of cause and effect. This tends toward a reductionistic understanding. Yeah, he gives you some big words, I think, of human life. Human life is to be understood primarily in biological terms or chemical terms or as a part of the evolutionary process or in sociological terms or anthropological terms. Come on now. In physiological terms. The humanistic aspect of this perceptual frame of reference claims ultimate human control over the destiny of the race. Do we have ultimate human control? And the planet. Here is humanity seeking to build a city for itself with a tower whose top is in the heavens. Here is humanity seeking to make a name for itself. Here the dynamics of Babel are incarnate once again. The dynamics of fallen Babylon, which reject God, the creator of the natural order, reject humanity being created in the image of God as the center of human wholeness and rejects the realm of God as the matrix for a just and peaceful human society. See, matrix is another word for context, the, the, the background, the framing story, the uh, essence, in, in other words. So uh, whenever we leave God out, we, we're jumping into another uh, matrix. To the extent that the church adopts the values and methods of the naturalistic humanism as a means of its life in the world, to that extent, it has been compromised and subverted by the beast. When the church adopts administrative styles and structures that dehumanize persons, it has been compromised by fallen Babylon. When the church becomes more concerned with its preservation than its witness, it has been compromised by fallen Babylon. When the church becomes a defender of the status quo in the face of poverty and injustice, it has been compromised. When the church is more concerned for its comfort than its confrontation with the destructive powers of the beast in the world, it has been conquered by the beast. When the church baptizes the destructive values of the world and adopts them as its own, it has been subverted by the dragon. When the church becomes more concerned with appearance and public relation than with the witness of Christ, it has been compromised by fallen Babylon. John's readers in the Roman province of Asia, as for Christians today, this context of the church's existence in the world gives far deeper dimensions of the church's involvement in Christ through the Eucharist. In the Eucharist, the church encounters the living Christ whose presence proves the dynamics of the church's relationship with God and the church's life in the world. The Eucharist calls the church's values, structures, and dynamics into the presence of Christ, where they may be seen for what they are. The Eucharist calls the church's life in the world into the presence of Christ, that it may be seen for what it is. The Eucharist calls the church into the presence of Christ that it might become the incarnation of that presence, both in the nature of its being, the Word of God, and in its life in the world, the witness of Jesus. So that's his sermon on, on uh, the impact. What I mean, <clears throat> I think what what you're seeing is um, this is 
his core message as to what is being translated or being conveyed by this vision. Uh, it's not about future times and places. It's about the church today. The church then, the church over the over the centuries and the church today. Do you see how Pat, Pat Robertson was quoted as saying about the journalist Jamal Khashoggi that you know it's it's really too bad that he was murdered and dismembered like that. But what is one life compared to a one hundred billion dollar arms sale? Yeah, uh, <laughs> I heard him say that. I so, I mean, uh, taking over. Pat Robertson. Pat Robertson's a famous nobody. Ninety. He's in his 90s. He's an evangelical preacher, you know, on television. Was he serious or being facetious? No, no, he was serious. No, he wasn't being facetious. That's his take on it. He was being serious. Yeah, he was being facetious. That's what Trump said. By what we just heard, has he been compromised by fallen Babylon? Oh, yeah. I don't know. 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 I See, that's how, that's the context that we're, we're looking at. And as soon as, as soon as you say that having an arms deal is more important than truth or life or justice, you know, we've been compromised. And, you know, and that was my sarcastic comment. You know, we as Christians are all about money and arms. Uh, that... That becomes the the unfortunate thing is he has a pretty big pulpit uh, amongst a large group of people. That I think it's a pulpit, but I see that as being evidence of what uh, what we're reading uh, in the Book of Revelation. And I think if 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 you begin to see that as you read it, it will begin to to say, well, I see how this is taking place today. I see where this is. And I can guarantee you that the church has adopted it, tries to adopt. When we adopt Robert's rule, when we adopted, whenever it was that we adopted Robert's rules of order for how we conduct our business, we have become part of fallen Babylon. Because what is, the, what is how are we to, to operate within the church? We're, we're, we're to work with consensus, where everyone has a voice, where the, there's not winners and losers. We all participate in the decision-making together, and we, uh, you know, we become a body <coughs> in terms of that. In the process of discernment. It becomes a process, yes, uh, uh, with a consensus you have a process of discernment, discerning what, what is God calling us to do in this situation. They involve a prayer, uh, prayer night. You may, you may not, uh, we have a, we have a, a uh, sister church who is going to use our facility next month for uh, an evening meal and then they're going to do a prayer vigil till 6 o'clock in the morning. Wow. Uh, and you know, I don't know what the vigil is based on, but obviously there, there's something going on that they're serious about praying. Yeah. About when is that? Direction forward. Next when morning. is that? When? When? I think it's the 16th of November or something like that. Oh, so it's after the election. <laughs> yeah, it's, it is after the election. Good point. In yeah. order, but no, it's, uh, they're, they're basically, uh, I'm just, I'm just, I don't know what the background is, yeah. but they're, they're, they, got, they presently don't have enough room for their church to gather okay. and have a meal and do that, and so that's why they're using our facility for that night. But I'm just saying that's they're probably doing some discernment uh, in terms of prayer and that sort of thing. So, you know, 
there's a lot of things that we need to look at in terms of the church and say, are we actually, are we being faithful? Uh, he uses the term, I think, in this session that we are called, chosen, okay? I mean, that's, that's who belongs. That's, that's the criteria for New Jerusalem. Now, who is not called? Okay. Well, you're good Methodist. <laughs> no, I, I, believe, I believe that's true. I, I don't believe it. I believe everybody receives a call. And I think basically all are chosen in some fashion. Here's where we have a problem. Some of them don't pick up the phone to answer the call. Some of them don't pick up the phone to answer the call. You're absolutely right. That's a good yeah, one. That's a good one. That's a very good one. Yeah. That's exactly right. I don't yeah. Or they may answer the call and say, I don't want, I don't want any of yeah. mm -hmm. right. yeah. the But we, we, and I think as you read the session tonight with the, the bowls of woes that are poured out and, and the idea of God's fire, uh, uh, Fire, as we talked about a few weeks ago, fire is a cleansing fire. When, when God pours fire out, it's a cleansing fire. The idea is to get rid of the beast within uh, the midst of the earth. Uh, the, I think one of the things... And I know this is difficult for me, and I, I'm sure it's difficult for us, uh, is to say that cleansing fire is not to destroy us or even those who are participating in fallen Babylon. It's to cleanse those in fallen Babylon of the beast. It's to remove that unholiness, to uh, to cleanse them of that so that they can become citizens of, of New Jerusalem. So I, I think that, and maybe I'm tinting the, my understanding of that by also believing that it's God's will that we all, that all of God create, God's creation be enfolded in New Jerusalem. That it's God's will for all of creation to be part of New Jerusalem. But those who are worshiping the beast, and when the beast is part of that, when fallen Babylon is part of who people worship, then they can't be part of that. You, he says in here pretty plainly that you're either a citizen of New Jerusalem or you're a citizen of fallen Babylon. There's no dual citizenships. <laughs> you can't be born. You may be born in one and go to the other, but when you go to the other, you lose your citizenship of where you're born. I think it says toward the end of Revelation, though, doesn't it, that the gates are always going to be open? And whoever, no matter how bad they are and how late in time it is, if they do repent, they can come in. I, 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 uh, I think when we get there next week, that's exactly where, where it is. And that's what he's, that's what he's saying in the, in the session tonight. That, 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 that all of that stuff that's happening to fallen Babylon is in an attempt to move them into a position to become members of New Jerusalem. It's not a condemnation as much as it is a, uh, a call <laughs> or to say there is another way, folks. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and maybe that's one of the places where we who are in New Jerusalem have failed. To live out that gospel in such a way that others 
see it as another way. You know, I think all of us have maybe had an experience where somebody asks the question, why do you do what you do? You know, why, why do you build a, why do you make a castle there? And uh, you've been working all day, you go home, you're making a meal, and you're taking it someplace. Why do you do that? And if people aren't asking the question, maybe we need to be baking our casserole outside so that they see us do it. Maybe they need to need to know why it is that we do, and that we are different. That we are different. We work by a different set of a different set of rules. I have a uh, off subject, just sort of a I had a thought about that movie with him, you know, from Pollyanna. And that what happened if she took the town from fallen Babylon to New Jerusalem when you look at it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's a There's a movie. And I, 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 I I've heard a lot of comments about the the Hallmark. Ancient channel. time. Oh, ancient time. <laughs> But there was a, a couple of well, a couple of shows, and, and it's it's a series on the Hallmark Channel where uh, this woman supposedly has some unusual powers. Her name is Cassie, and, and I can't remember exactly uh, the titles. But is it the Good Witch? Uh, supposedly, she is the Good Witch, yeah. uh, but. Throughout the movie, from beginning to end, you do not hear her make a negative statement on anything or anybody. Everything is a positive statement that things work themselves out. You'll you'll do okay. you I mean, and, and it's just. You don't realize it until you're about halfway through the movie. Say, she hasn't said a negative thing yet, <laughs> and stuff is happening all around her, and it and it's craziness. And, that, and she hasn't dealt. You know, I don't see her do any magic or anything like that. But I'm just saying, her magic is positivity. <laughs> that uh, there is a positivity. I think that's. That's what we are also called to, is the positivity of God's will for us in, in the midst of the world. And that, um, you know, I'm not saying that when someone loses a child that we go up and say, oh, it's God's will, and uh, <laughs> that's not what I'm saying. Uh, so, but there is, uh, there is a positive way of understanding to say, we are here in the midst of your pain to suffer with you, and God suffers with you. And in that suffering, God brings about hope. Uh, you can go back to the 12th chapter of Revelation and read that story again of God's self-giving act of dying to win the battle. Sacrifice becomes a key to winning. Uh, and that's a different story than the world knows. That's why that's why the devil is taken by surprise. Doesn't uh, you drag him. What happened here? You know? I had a child all of a sudden I don't. Uh, so um, <clears throat> I think we are we are hearing him give his reasons for why we the church need to move move out uh, move forward uh, outside the walls of the outside church. the walls That's right. Um, 
you guys are letting me talk, and I don't like this. It's okay. Um, <laughs> see, he, he, here's what he put in, in page 91 about the fire. What John seems to see in 158 is that nothing unholy can enter into the presence of the holy God until the fire of God's holiness has consumed all that is unholy. Does it mean that the material is consumed? It means that the essence is consumed. Um, that the being is changed. Till the fire of God's holiness has consumed all that is unholy. Instead of repenting in the presence of the holiness that burns against their unholiness, they continue their posture of blasphemy against God. In other words, they could say, okay, God. They could say, you are a just God, and, and we love you. But they go again. The men mention of repentance... Uh, in 16, 9 and 11, however, reveals that the plagues of God's wrath are redemptive mm -hmm. in their intention. Mm -hmm. God's not punishing. God's trying to redeem. Mm -hmm. Now, maybe you don't agree with the way God goes about doing it, but you can take that up with him some other time. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is one... Um, instance in where someone's personal translation of the Greek it gives us a new wrinkle on this because I don't think I ever read it before except in the mortal wound, how the beast or whatever had a mortal wound in one of its heads and that is a very different concept from a plague yes. and now he brings out that really the, the word in the Greek would be more typically used for a plague yeah. and that's a real uh, sea change of a difference in meaning could be more of a thorn in the, in the, thorn in the side of the beast so yeah. that's a very worthwhile insight worth the price of admission alone for me yeah. you know to hear a different take on that translation like that that's well the, the idea that his, his point is that New Jerusalem becomes that thorn in the, in the side of the beast you know if, if we're doing what we need to be doing, mm -hmm. the, it's going to cause a reaction. Uh, at least it's going to cause the beast to scratch it. You know? uh, so if we're doing uh, what we're intended to, the fire of God's holiness is the fire of God's love. Uh, I think there's... Uh, many contemplatives who talk about and write about the fire of God's love. That God's love is both comforting but also inspiring and uh, cleansing. Uh, and we, we read that in other parts of the scripture. But so, but it's it's not meant as punishment, it's meant as redemption, as healing. And that's a different perspective, I think, than, than we, we hear about, about this story. Uh, the fire of God's holiness is the fire of God's love, which seeks the cleansing, healing, and wholeness of the beloved. To those who respond, the holy love of God becomes a cleansing, healing, transforming presence. To those who reject the fire of the love, the holy love of God appears as a tormenting plague of wrath. Perspective, huh? Perspective. Um, the, uh, on page 92, uh, he talks about name and why is name important? The nature. Name and nature are uh, equivalent. Um, and so when we say God we could say God is love, we're describing, but we're also naming. Uh, 
uh, God's nature. Uh, and uh, here, here's, a, here's a definition of church that I bet you don't hear a lot. The church is itself the holiness of God poured out into the earth and the sea. <coughs> It's our church, don't we? Really, it's God's church. We are God's church, poured out into the sea, into the earth. Um, he talks about uh, uh, the uh, importance of the Euphrates River as a boundary. The known world at that time between the Persians and the Babylonians and the Roman world. Um, that's just kind of an aside. You don't think it uh, when you when you see it listed there as a boundary. You know why is that there? He's just describing why that boundary is important in that in that setting and culture. Um, the um, he talks about uh, how many of you have heard about Armageddon and, and what's to take place at Armageddon? Big battle. Big battle. Final battle. Always a battle. See that, that's. That's fallen Babylon. <laughs> They're always in the battle. Um, um, and he has a, he has an aside here. What what he's saying is, as it's described in the vision, there's really no place that exists uh, like that. So when somebody tells you that they know exactly where it's going to take place. Uh, with that. Good luck with that. Well, they they have come up with their own understanding of where they think it ought to be, um, or or they've had their own vision, uh, so to speak. I have a friend who has a late night, and we always it can be anywhere. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it can be anywhere. And he said that he actually places and he said that we did a lot of reading, we did a lot of book work, he and his wife. By the fourth time, nobody came. Nobody wanted to hear what they wanted to hear was on the game. And he wasn't preaching on the <laughs> Well, and I think, I think that that is, that's sad, but I think it's, it's true. That, Who, who are the people who want to see Armageddon? Well, I don't want to even narrow it down, but I want to say, what is, what is their, what's their value system? What's the, what's Power. the character? It's, it's winning. How are they? If you, if you think you're on the winning side, then. Yeah, you want to see the bad guys get there. You know, we're the good guys. Uh, we we're going to be okay on Armageddon because God's on our side. on our side. Okay. Um, and see, I think that's part of fallen Babylon. Even Abraham Lincoln said he would prefer that. What's it, was that famous quote from Lincoln that, that we should be on God's side? Yeah, not not expect God to be on our side. <laughs> the hard part is being on God's side. <laughs> And staying there, <laughs> yeah. Well, see, that's it. That's one of the places where I think we blaspheme. Is that we come up with our plans and and our intentions, and then we pray for God to bless it. <laughs> and and I think that's totally upside down and backwards. 
Because our prayer should be, God, what is it that you'd have us do? What direction would you have us move? Where would you have us go? Uh, we understand you as a loving God of all people, caring God for all people. What would you have us do? Go out and murder 10,000? I, I think that that's... I don't think we put things like that in that reference. Uh, and, and have it for a long time. It's not just today, but we didn't get to where we're at today <laughs> overnight or even in the last two years. Uh, it's been a while getting us to the point that we are, we are at. So he says, the forces of fallen Babylon are gathered at, and he writes it as Harmageddon. H-A-R-M-A-G-E. Uh, and uh, the place name is a mystery. In Jewish history, the area of Megiddo was the site of the victory of Deborah over Barak. Tell me about Deborah. What did Deborah do? Or she was she was the woman general. And uh, her story is in the book of Judges. Right. She was one of the judges. Um, Deborah and Barak over the forces of the Philistine general Sisera. What, how did Sisera die? There you go. Yeah. You remember those gory details. Judith. Wasn't that the story of Judith? No, Deborah was a general, but she's not the one that did. I don't know. I can't remember what the. Judith is the one who put the stake in. Judith. We'll, we'll look at that. I don't remember. I know that he, he died by a stake being driven into his stone. Uh, gory stuff. While he was asleep. While he was asleep, yeah. It was the place where Ahaziah fled to die the revolt of Jehu. Jehu was one of David's um, uh, generals, and when uh, he died, then all, <clears throat> all kingdom broke loose. Which overthrew, the, <laughs> which overthrew the worship of Baal in Israel and reestablished the worship of Yahweh. It was a location where Pharaoh Necho defeated and killed Josiah. That's in 2 Kings. If the word is pronounced with a rough breathing, that's just what uh, Linda was talking about. Hug again. Uh, as most Greek texts suggest, then the Hebrew would mean Mount Megiddo. But no mountain is near Megiddo. Although Carmel, where Elijah defeated the prophets of Baal, is in the distance, it is given a smooth breathing Armageddon. The Hebrew would mean Megiddo city, and there was such a place near the plain of as Drylon. This location is one where decisive battles have been fought for millennia. The battles of Pharaoh Tutmosis III in 1468 to that of Lord Allenby in the First World War. If the vision focuses upon the mountain, the most logical mountain near Megiddo would be Carmel. The vision has already used the image of 42 months as a period of rebellious orders activity against God's people. One of the focal forerunners of this image is the three and a half years under Elijah, when there was no rain. This period of drought and tribulation for Israel was caused by the institution of the worship of Baal, or Baal, by Jezebel, and was brought to a close over the victory of Elijah over the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. So, see, I, I, I read that only to, to show that how deep you have to dig into the history of uh, not only Judaism, but everything that's happened in that part of the world to, to determine what's trying to be said there. And uh, never, uh, never heard. And how long is, how long is 40 years? A long time. How long is 40 days? A long time. When you haven't eaten, 40 days is a long time. Uh, well, 
But the, uh, the great voice from the throne proclaiming it is done portrays the now not yet reality of God's response to the rebellious order. Uh, there is a part of part of our faith that is uh, a done and not yet done uh, part of our faith. We we know that there is the crucifixion and the death and the resurrection, but there is and that has been done. But then there is. Uh, not yet. There's still uh, the game is still going on. Uh, the chess game is still being played. Uh, God's purposes in the rebellious realm have already been accomplished, even though the realm continues to exist. And. Uh, <coughs> um, now. The agony of defeat. Well, the, all of these two chapters, I don't want to go into too much detail or reading these. And I would invite you not to get too drugged down into the details so much as to understand that all of Babylon is defeated. Uh, the defeat takes place. That there, that there is a the idea of the beast the essence of the beast is destroyed at some point in time. When that occurs, we don't know. We have a sense that the beast continues, but the, cease, the beast has been defeated. So there's uh, that ongoing. Here, when we get to, to chapter 11, we have another woman show up. The harlot. Uh, how many times in the Old Testament do you think Israel has been called the harlot? A lot. And what did did it mean that they were all going out and having sexual encounters? <laughs> what did it mean? <laughs> Meant that they were unfaithful to God. That they they had were worshiping other gods. They were worshiping Baal or what are, you know, gods of the Philistines, gods of uh, other countries. Uh, and so the, the idea of, of, I think I shared this last week, for, the idea of fornication, the idea of whoredom, uh, Harlotry, all of this has to do with worship. It has to do with where we place our trust. It has to do with where where we're placing our faith. Uh, and, uh, uh, and then the uh, in uh, in this picture you see uh, the. The harlot is mounted on top of the beast, and so, uh, and she becomes, she's dressed in, in a manner that would indicate that uh, pointing to Rome uh, as being uh, kind of the essence, that Rome becomes the current tool of the beast. Uh, you know, the, the beast is, uh, is in, uh, I don't want to say, put this in androgynous terms, but the beast is almost an eternal being. Uh, uh, in other words, timeless, I guess I should say. Not, not bound necessarily by time. You have, a, you have the beast in one age and the beast in another age. It's still the beast, but appearance is different, uh, appears in a different fashion. Uh, but the essence stays the same. And the same thing is true of Christ. Christ is the same in all ages, I think, but Christ becomes apparent to us in, in, in more than one form. 
And we're called to be Christ for one another. Uh, we read Mother Teresa of Calcutta that the reason she was caring for the destitute and dying in Calcutta was that she saw the face of Jesus on each one. Um, so Christ comes to us uh, in, in many faces. That's one of the reasons that uh, there has always been a search for the historical Jesus to see how, how does Christ actually come to us and in what way. Um, in Revelation 17, 9 to 10, the angel pro next provides John with the historic details of the vision for his own day. The seven hills are obviously the seven hills upon which Rome was built. And the indication that Rome is the historic manifestation of the beast in John's day. In the fluidity of the imagery, however, the seven heads are also the seven kings. Five have fallen, but which five? If the angel is giving John the historic manifestation of the beast in his own day, where does the count of the emperors begin? And then he lists the different emperors ending with Nero. Um, how many of you are Roman scholars in terms of uh, how Julius Caesar came? You know, before Julius Caesar, what was what was the what was the role? Or how was the government organized? It was a republic. It was a republic. The origin of senators. And a senator, you had to be a landowner. We had to own horses, not just be a landowner, but you had to own horses. And then you were qualified to run for senator, and senators were actually elected. And they had a, a that's where our form of government was based on. Yep. And um, it was Julius Caesar. In fact, this, this is interesting because just yesterday on PBS, I watched that interesting show about Julius Caesar, Shakespeare's Julius Caesar. And they showed different productions of it through time, the different oh. characters who pay, played, and they focused on the character of Brutus uh -huh. and, all, and what the implications for the murder of Caesar you know, really were. But um, Caesar was the first one because he'd been so successful As a general. in Gaul. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, if you took Latin, you remember? <laughs> So I mean, and he was so popular that he felt that the people were actually going to proclaim an emperor, and, and at least according to Shakespeare's play, and I think history, they did offer it three times, and he really wanted it, but for political reasons, he refused to be proclaimed emperor three times. But he knew he was going to, you know, do it in the end because the people apparently wanted a strong man at that time, you know, that they were, I guess, tired of representative government and they were ready for dictatorship, as so many other cultures in history, including our own, you know, have gone, have seemed to go that route. It seems to be a typical human progression. We don't want to work as hard as it takes right. to be a, to be yeah. a republic. But yeah. Rome wasn't always bad. I mean, you know, in the olden days there of the republic, there were men of letters, they worked on their language, making their language a better instrument for communication. The Roman matron, the mother of the family, women were very highly regarded, you know, in their role of mother and, and head of the household and so forth. So Rome started out, you know, having many great cultural values and everything kind of just deteriorated as they gained more and more uh, powerful military men, not of course just Julius Caesar, but Mark Antony and Cassius and others who were, that went well, the military these. route and they were very popular and they conquered many lands and you started having this political situation with these powerful men that were jockeying for, you know, for the top. Um, and that's basically all of these who are listed, Caesar Augustus, uh, well, and all, yeah. all, of the, all of the killings that went on, family members and, and uh, everything else for Augustus to be in power, uh, is, and, and it seemed to continue for... Do you remember your I, Claudius, all the history of all the murders, murders. that went on? Oh, okay. yes. So, <laughs> it, it was... Uh, it's it's interesting for them. You know, at, at one level, they uh, they were very uh, generous in terms of allowing people's religious uh, 
uh, expressions. They had, they had multiple religious views, uh, and it wasn't until later on, initially, Christianity was part of Judaism, and Judaism had kind of been grandfathered in and, and was part of their, their culture. But then, uh, I think because the church really became effective, <clears throat> then it began to be persecuted uh, because it began to stand out, it began to be different than the rest of the culture. And, and that's uh, what caused so much of the persecution. Uh, anyway, he describes here how how the imagery points uh, to Rome and to the different people and the, the gematria associated with the numbers uh, pointing to Nero uh, or Domitian could have been one of the uh, uh, and then he goes into detail waging war on the beast. Um, and John, at the top of page 103, John likely sees here again another angelic representation of Christ. No other angel in the vision has great authority. Several other figures are given and are allowed to have authority, but only God and Christ possess authority. The attribute of brightness of glory adds to the likelihood that this angel is Christ. Every other use of the word glory for a heavenly figure throughout the vision is associated with God or Christ. <clears throat> the attributes of brightness have been used repeatedly for John's vision of Christ. Therefore, this angel is probably Christ. The vision now expands on the condition of fallen Babylon, which was introduced in 148. Two new dimensions are added. The first element of fallen Babylon is the dwelling place of demons, the prison of unholiness. The use of the unclean bird image is especially appropriate. The droppings of an unclean, unholy animal or bird were also unclean and defiled whatever they touched. The implication is that these unholy birds flying throughout Babylon ensure the unholiness of the entire city. The second element introduced into the picture of fallen Babylon is the political and economic dimensions that were hinted at in the image of the third rider. Remember the third rider is the, the one who had economic destruction, uh, had carried the balance, injustice, so on and so forth. Uh, there, the, there the poor were kept at subsistence level uh, but the wealthy were unaffected. Uh, the political power structure becomes an incarnation of the beast by setting itself up in the place of God. The economic dynamics reflect the rampant consumerism of a mode of life that has no sense of stewardship, but only possession. And he talks about, of course, in the, in the uh, vision, the kings have all had fornication with the whore, right? So kings are all bad. Uh, the merchants, the merchants are all out to get what they can get. And uh, the seafarers, those associated with the sea, lament the loss of Babylon's virtues because they don't have anybody to trade with anymore. Uh, so uh, and then he does a flashback there. But this basically just shows the, the demise of fallen Babylon. And uh, when uh, I, I would invite you to, uh, let's go to page 107 at the, at the end. We've been talking about this, so let's really see what, what he says. And, uh, somebody want to read Discerning Babylon in Our Midst? Out loud? <laughs> I discovered I don't have my reading glasses. I can't see anything. Oh, oh, yeah. Go ahead, please. Um, Paul recognized this condition of human existence when he wrote, Our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but historic human structures of evil. 
but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly place. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. Uh, John and Paul put their finger upon the only sound basis for Christian action in a world dominated by the horrors and abominations of Babylon. The church must have the discernment to realize the true enemy and to enter into the struggle, not employing the methods and perspectives of fallen Babylon, but those of New Jerusalem. When the church indeed enters into the struggle, when it begins to show forth the reality of the presence and purpose of God in the midst of fallen Babylon, it will begin to experience warfare with the dragon. Are not the destructive dynamics of fallen Babylon seen in consumer-oriented in a consumer-oriented economy whose advertising plays upon the basis dynamics of human self-indulgence, pride, and greed? Do not Christian organizations succumb to the dynamics of fallen Babylon when they manipulate people to give support based on what the giver will receive in return? Are these not dynamics active in political systems that dehumanize people by playing the role of God and controlling the lives and activities of its citizens? Thank you. Okay. Comments? Arguments? <laughs> the, uh, I think it, in terms of and I don't know how, my son has worked in the advertising industry for a number, number, number of years and um, I think this is the thing that I despise most about our consumerism and our advertising. Now I can understand advertising <clears throat> for something that you know is a needed commodity. Mm -hmm. We maybe advertise where you can get food, where you can get a job, where uh, where needed necessities, even you know, advertising uh, basic transportation. But when you advertise in a way that creates the need mm -hmm. to sell the product, mm -hmm. that's the whole purpose of the advertising, is to create the need See, yeah. but that's a change from when I was. But, 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 but there's that advocate here is a clear interest, not a need. Well, no, I, you know. <laughs> <laughs> maybe it, it, it might be an interest, but. You may not see it as a need, but I may feel like <laughs> Well, I, and I think that that's, uh, when a new product comes out, that I've lived very well for, yeah. 40 years without, yeah. and, yeah. and I begin to, better, easier. Huh? it might make your life easier or better, but you don't need it. And, well, maybe it's a new slipper. But I, yeah, I, exactly. And Chris is right, we begin to, we begin to develop a, a stuff, right? I think we, we begin, they catch, capture our interest, but, mm -hmm. They almost, as they continue on, they almost make them like, well, you're not anything if you don't, uh, you know. Oh, you, yeah. Your life is going to be miserable if you don't oh, buy yeah. this or that. Yeah, that's that's what about the big bought drugs and advertisements uh, and medication? Big bought yeah. yeah, yeah, big bought. Yeah. You put that in there? So, you know, maybe they have some sales. I have to do it. Well, the end. Uh, we we live in that situation where yes I'm interested I've, I've lived very well without it for a long time. Well, you need your microwave. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Almost everything that Amazon sells. But I don't need a two hundred dollar microwave or a five hundred dollar microwave. Uh, that's I think that's. Uh, yeah. The ones that get me are the drug ones. For the first initial yeah. for every single thing, mm -hmm. most of which is somebody always has, but they develop the drug. They make you think you're sick by giving you the initial plan. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and then you go to your doctor and you say, this is what I want. And he says, well, come on, really, brother, it's a waste of time. Yeah. You know, and 
Or your or your drug plan will pay for that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, when they when when the time it takes to run through the potential side effects is triple. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Time it takes to run through the benefits. Benefits. That's right. Yeah. Scary, uh, huh? So. <laughs> yeah. I don't think it's worse than whatever you got. I think yeah. you guys understand this. No, I don't. <laughs> uh, Grace, Grace. Grace has a question. Yeah. I just wanted to say that, that um, the advertising is very calculated. <laughs> but it's starting back in the 1980s when they had oh, something to show oh. And they used something oh. called the mag factor. And now the medical um, manufacturers have started using that same theory to get patients to nag their doctors yeah. to let them have these medications. Mm -hmm. And to be perfectly honest, mm -hmm. I think that advertising mm -hmm. on media to patients I would agree. We live in a we well, this is part of the fallenness. I mean we we are how, how many of you are gonna go home and write your uh, local TV station and say, we don't want to see these things anymore. I just don't watch them. Well, we don't. I have a mute button. Mean, a mute button. Um, well, that, and, that, and that's okay if somebody calls on a survey and say, did you watch so-and-so ad? Then you can say, no. no, or I despise that ad or whatever. But, or is that the one I muted? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But nobody ever calls me, so I can't tell you. Well, so I have to write that in. Fact, the commercial, but you would never. <laughs> and that's what they care about. That's right. You remember it. And like coconut beer has a lukewarm pouring. They are advertising a premium liquor. Forget the association with a drink. Mm -hmm. It has nothing to do with anything that's going to be going on. Yeah. And they kill yourself. Yeah. 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 Yeah
with core mainline Islamists. And you could almost have this discussion with them, and they would understand that fallen Babylon is... Is us. <laughs> well, no, I don't necessarily think that they, they do. I, I think I think where, where we get into trouble is the fundamental fringes mm -hmm. uh, of both of our yeah, uh, I mean, religious faiths. And, and I'm saying not just right side, but left side. Uh, we fall off the edges. I think. Uh, I think if we stay uh, in the core, but I, I just know too many um, Islamic people who are their primary goal is to honor God. Now they call God Allah, but Allah is a Semitic term for God. Uh, it's it's not a different language. It's it's a Semitic term. As a matter of fact, uh, some scholarship would say that that was one of the early terms that that uh, the Jewish people used. El. Uh, El. Uh -huh. uh, so, uh, no, I think I think I think they are trying to honor God. Whether I think in many cases. Many of their, uh, many is, uh, Islamic people have been, uh, many Muslims have been misled just by this, as, as we have been misled uh, and by false teaching and, uh, and ways that don't honor God. So, I mean, we have churches today who are, who, who are calling themselves Christian and preaching hate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, and we have Christian churches who are preaching, well, it's all about God blessing you for prosperity, you know. Mm -hmm. it's, it's Old Testament religion, you know. If, if, you're, if you're rich, you're obviously righteous. Uh, and, uh, you know, if you're poor, you've obviously done something wrong. It's, it's the old joke story. So, um, you know, I, I, I don't see it in, in terms of religion, but I, I think that they can, they can see fall of battle all around them just the way we see fall of battle all around us. I heard a statistic that Mormonism and Islam are the fastest growing religions in the world today. And they are reaching out. That's right. I wondered if they were just, you know, being, a, you know, the beast and the dragon is amassing his army. I'm just, I'm just, this is just a thought I had. I'm not saying I believe it. I'm just throwing it out for discussion. Yeah, they're more active in trying to, trying to, yeah. trying to spread the religion. You know, the Mormons did that. They did a few up, excuse me, love and missions. And yep. They're phenomenal. The way, yep. the way their families are, I mean, there's a lot of things to look at. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of positives, there's some pagans, but there's a lot of positives. There's no technology at all. Everybody. How they baptize their ancestors. Mm -hmm. yep. I know that's about yep. it. Oh, okay. Well, you might want to look up their theology. Well, I, I, think, yeah, I, think I, I, I think. Yeah, I don't think. I think that's that's not the point. I think I would agree with you. I, I don't agree with the theology. Basically, the theology of Islam or the theology of, of Mormonism. But I do think that in in their way, however they understand it, they think they are honoring God. And, Individual people. Yeah. And uh, don't you think that applies to all the world, the major world religions? Well, I think that's kind of what he's saying here. If we if we move out and say, let's let's honor God, and let's not. Well, we had the same problem when we came to this country. We had we had native peoples who understood that there was a creator, that there was someone who who brought. The rain and someone who was responsible for all that was created before they arrived, and they honored in whatever rituals that they did, and they did, and we call that pagan because we failed to understand. So I think in today we've learned in missionary that you go to an area uh, and you 
sit and watch and wait with the people like Paul did when he went to Athens and you say oh yeah here's here's who God is let me tell you about who God is you're worshiping God but let me tell you a little bit more about God and and you begin to help people understand that you're you're both uh, in the vein of worshiping God you've just chosen different ways to do it I have a question then so how does and I'm pardon me because this is our first class we've taken so maybe you've covered this but so then how does the belief in the non-belief in Jesus Christ how does that play out in these other religions and well my 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 feeling is that my my understanding is that we have taken portions of of the gospel and made it exclusive where it was never intended to be exclusive uh, you know you can take the passage in John you know where no one comes to the father except by me but you can also look at a passage where he says in my father's mansion there are many rooms what does he mean by that does he mean he has other peoples that uh, he is uh, God to? Uh, is there a place in God's house for many different peoples? I, I think what I'm hearing through this is the idea is we are called to honor, honor God and, and to accept God's existence and to also accept part of the following is in being faithful is uh, is kind of getting a sense that God wants all of God's creation enfolded and we don't do that by by division and dividing out and exclusion we do it by including and then helping understand uh, you know I can't I can't teach you about God unless you're willing to invite me in to, to, to teach about God and that's where mostly the church has been failing over the past few years we've not been doing a very good job of placing ourselves in a position where we can be invited in uh, to say this is what I believe and, and I don't believe God condemns everyone he condemns certain acts and he condemns certain acts because they're destructive to all that he created or she created and that uh, God God created in a loving way and God's love is in the midst of that creation um, and that's when we talk about the beast and all of this it's that which is destroying all that God created um, and uh, you know, which includes animals, uh, includes the pollution. Pollution. Uh, yeah. I mean, it, yeah. that's and again, yeah. I'm, I'm going to be open enough to say yes. I'm preaching a bit, but I think that my understanding from my study of the gospel is that uh, Jesus was an was not exclusionary if someone said I want to follow you he didn't say well you got to follow me exactly this way well I guess what I'm asking is because a lot of times you know I don't know I I grew up in a different thinking a different way but I guess and it's always been a call it a contradiction for me because I I was raised where it was like if you don't believe in Jesus Christ, you're, you're not getting to heaven. <laughs> that's, right. that's how I was raised. Uh -huh. and, well, and probably yeah. most of us. And, most of us were. And, but then I've always wondered about that. How about people if you live in, I don't know, some really remote area of the planet, which I know there's not too many places like that anymore, but where you're not exposed to that? Because I'm always thinking, God is a loving God, then why would He? Like, why would he exclude people that 
we're never exposed, you know. And, and that's that's part of where where I'm coming from. I don't think yeah, God does. Well, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think it does. Could it be that when Jesus said, no one comes to the Father but by me, he's referring to his own death and resurrection, right. not necessarily to the individual's knowledge and understanding of that death and resurrection. And then when Paul says, is it, I think it's in Romans, that even those who have never heard the gospel are without excuse because they see God in the creation right. around them. It's not condemning them so much as it's saying everyone has this, this understanding that there is a God out there, just like we talked about the Native Americans recognizing that there was a God and valuing the creation. They were even more, much more than the Europeans, they were taking God's order to take care of creation more to heart than the Europeans and the Christians were. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that that's uh, the direction of, of understanding what part of our faith is culture and what part of our faith is, is actually faith in God. What is it that God wants for us? That's what I think is important about this study of Revelation because it kind of gives us a hint of what what is important to God. Uh, God saw that creation was important enough for God to be self-giving. Uh, and uh, for God you know, when we see the story of the child being being snatched and then or being taken and then snatched back and uh, uh, all of that uh, being a mythological story that describes who God is uh, and uh, how much uh, to what extent would God go to redeem even his fallen angels um, and that the, he goes to the extent of dying himself. Uh, that's, I think that's an unusual story. Mm -hmm. It's not a story that, that we, we hear. Now, at pieces, we, we recognize heroism in our soldiers when they give of themselves sacrificially. We, we recognize it in, in bits and pieces, but we don't do a very good job of recognizing it in our faith and daily living. But it's just a, a story popped up on, on uh, Instagram. Um, this guy is sitting in his chair with a little kitten. He is, and it, it's a horror, horrific story. Horrific from the standpoint that it, it describes fallen Babylon to almost its fallenness. That somebody had placed this small kitten <coughs> in the middle of the road and glued its feet to, to the roadway. And cars were going over it and around and, and Fortunately, it didn't get hit, and, he, and this gentleman came along and saw what it was and slammed on the brakes and turned his car sideways, turned flashers on, and, and got out, stopped traffic, and uh, I don't know how he extracted the, the kitten from, uh, but he said it wasn't something that the, the cat had walked through something sticky and then was glued, and glue had been applied to uh, the feet of and, and so, you know, here's a hero, I think, in terms of his willingness to, that was a pretty dangerous act, you know, a little bit for, for a small kitten, and, but that's the act of, that's how important, I think God, that's a God-like act. Like the bunny in the fire. Yeah, just to just, just sacrifice, uh, uh, and there's stories like, stories like that, the story of the, the Velveteen Rabbit, 
Well, but the idea is how, how do we bad men? <laughs> okay, all right. But but we get that's how we we get worn is through love. And uh, so I don't know, I had a lot of kids that had a rabbit that looked like you've been drunk through a knothole. Uh, they held on to it for a long time. So uh, I, I think that I like where you're going in terms of saying we wrestle with this. And I think that's part of our faith journey is wrestling with those things. Uh, I don't think it's cut and dry. If it was cut and dry, we wouldn't need faith. Uh, we'd know the answer. But I'm sure within your life there's been there's a story that says God touched me in this way. And most of us who have have walked this journey with Jesus for a period of time, we know that God has touched us in some some certain way uh, that uh, is meaningful. That says, yeah, that points to the gospel. That points to the God that I believe. Because it's easier to believe that if he did certain things, you're going to go to heaven. That it is to actually do God's work. And that is where the rest gets. Because. You're saying religion is easy, it's faith that's the difficult. Exactly. <laughs> and also, one of the things was that the, um, the Muslim church is so strict in some ways that they feel like they can get to Nirvana and all the birdies. So it's, you know, if I'm real strict, I'm going to get there to Nirvana for what I do. Yeah, there's, but we have the same thing. Yeah. We have the same thing within Christianity oh, in terms yeah. of how, how we feel. Well, that's that's exactly. why, it's, why I say, you know, religion sometimes is easy, but, but faith is really difficult. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the difference. The now that you've distracted me and you've gotten off track. <laughs> <laughs> uh, before we leave, next week is our last one. Pastor Ed. Robert. Yes. <clears throat> you said earlier uh, you were either a citizen of New Jerusalem or a citizen of Bob and Babylon. Why do you think that the three words of the call of the chosen and the faithful? Mm -hmm. um, we don't have to do anything to be called. We don't have to do anything to be called. We have to be faithful. We don't have to be faithful. Yes. Have to be faithful. Right. So if we make one mistake, do we drop into the fallen back on? No. Where can we? How can we? What, what, is it, what, is it, what is an act of faithfulness? What? What is, uh, what's the difference between being faithful and being successful? Well, um, successful, you, you earn, you're like, you're supposed to earn it, aren't you? Well, it, mean, it means that you do enough right so that you become successful. You're talking about convenient grace where you don't have to do anything. Well, you have provenient grace, but you also have sanctifying grace where you, you know, provenient grace is God bef going before you and and being present before you even get there and doing things where you're not aware that God is even involved and then all of a sudden you realize hmm, God's presence and then you begin to say okay God I see you there and then then you move into the category of sanctification you say I want to follow but then you you begin to walk forward uh, but God doesn't abandon you in in that aspect, God continues to pour out God's spirit of grace upon you. And so our sanctification becomes kind of our working together with God in the midst of uh, uh, trying to be faithful. Do we backslide? Do we fall? Yes. yes. Are, are we perfect? No. Uh, 
the, the idea of being faithful is, first of all, persevering, continuing to try to keep our eye on the goal. Uh, in other words, focus on Christ. Uh, continuing to try to learn more about what it is that God wants in our life. Uh, and, and you continue trying to do that till you don't have breath any longer. Now, does it mean that you're going to change 10 people's lives, uh, convert or uh, introduce 10 people to Christ, 100 people to Christ, or nobody to Christ? Uh, you know, if you're faithful, it means you're continuing to keep your eye on Christ and do what you feel Christ is calling you to do. How successful you are in that, I don't think God judges. You, we do, and, and we we think maybe we failed, but I think if you're walking in that journey, what happens is you make changes or changes are made in the world around you you're not even aware of. People see you that uh, one of my churches uh, uh, the uh, one of the people had a story about. Uh, somebody walking to church uh, with his child and and uh, the child asked the dad why why do we have to walk to church with every Sunday because we may be the only people that I, that others see that are trying to be faithful uh, we people see us that we don't even know about and, uh, um, and so we don't witness just by what we say. We witness probably 99% by what we do. And yeah, we're going to fall down. You're going to fail. But being faithful means you get up and, and you keep going. Uh, right. Now you have Ed Denham's response to the gospel. <laughs> Probably not seven times seventy. Uh, you, know, uh, you know, look at that forgiveness uh, passage. You can put the things you can put faithful in the way of forgiveness. Uh, you know, we can fail seventy times seven, and and if we are continuing to try to keep God's focus in our life, I think we're trying to be faithful. And I think that's what that's what God called us to do. The very short response to sort of your question. Somebody asking, why do you go to church, okay? Somebody asked me, somebody, people who work for me, the person who worked for me asked me that, why do you go to church every Sunday? Because I was in a, a place that was open on uh, Sundays a week. And so I had to work sometimes on Sunday. And I didn't like that. And I told them that. Mm -hmm. And so why do you why do you want to go to church on Sunday? Well, what I said was not probably the best thing I could have said was, I might kill one of you guys if I didn't. That's what I said. But, you know, you know that probably was not the best thing I said. Maybe I went to church. Okay. And that was well, and, and it means that the next time you know that there probably could have been a better response. Yeah, so you, right. you work exactly. towards exactly. having a better response. What would I say? What would I, what would I say? The next person at the I think that was a good response. And I think that that's, that's the point. I, we're all going to fail. There's no doubt about that. Uh, if, if we didn't fail, there wouldn't be a fall in Babylon, and we would all be in New Jerusalem, it'd all be over, okay? But the reality is, we're in the midst of trying to be faithful. Trying to grow in. Well, I don't think so. Just keep seeding that sod, would you? <laughs> <laughs> you didn't say that he writes commercials. Uh, I agree. 
you're never going to just kind of, if you're focused, somehow you'll never be bad, you go what you're going to be down there and yeah. falling back a lot. As long as you believe in God. Yeah, the key is you don't give up. The, the key is, the idea of faithfulness is that you don't do it one time and quit. Uh, whether you're successful or whether you're not, you don't quit, you know. It's the next time and the next time and the next time and the next time. And, you know, the reality, look at, how old was Abraham when Abraham was called? We don't really know. We don't really know, but he was an old guy. And, you know, and, and the reality is, you may be infirm, um, and not be able to, well, you know, Stephen Hawking is, quote unquote, maybe an atheist, you don't really know. But he didn't quit. I mean, he was faithful to whatever he was faithful to. That's faithfulness. Even in the midst of, you know, inexorable odds, you, you continue. And that's, that's the importance. My camera. Bye bye. My camera says it's running out of power. Yeah, I'm running out of power, too. Thank you. Go in peace. May the peace of Christ be with you. Thank you. Are we going to have communion next week? Are we going to have communion next week? Sure. All right. Oh, great. We like that. What kind of bread? The good unleavened. <laughs> 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 <laughs>